privileged and blessed tonight to have Brother David Crow with us. Brother David, um, he's an Alabama boy. I know last night we had a Kentucky fan, tonight an Alabama guy. I don't know if they're trying to get us saved or we're trying to get them saved, but uh, one way or the other. Well, Brother David has um, pastored a number of years ago, probably 20, close to 25 years ago now. Uh, the Lord called him to work there at our home missions department in Nashville. Uh, through the years, he's done a little bit of it all there and uh, not too long ago was promoted to the director of our uh, North American ministries. He oversees the work of all of our, of our missionaries uh, in, uh, in the United States. Um, you know, you have foreign missionaries and then home missionaries. So he has a, a lot to do. He's just uh, been preaching this week in Indiana and uh, flew back in this afternoon, drove down here with us tonight. I know he's physically tired. But we're, we've been praying for him, and uh, normally he preaches like the Energizer Bunny, and we're not expecting anything less tonight. And so, Brother David, you come and you share with us what God's laid on your heart. We love you, brother. Man, love you too, Tim. Bless you. The Energizer Bunny's yeah. got, he's gotten old. <laughs> good evening. Yeah. It's good to see you tonight. Appreciate you coming out on a Monday night for a revival service. You, I know there, there are other things you could have done, other places you could have gone, but you made the choice to come to God's house. And I believe God honors when we are faithful to Him. With all of my heart, I believe that. I do appreciate your prayers. I am tired, and <clears throat> I, I left Wabash, Indiana, and drove to Fort Wayne this morning early. Flew from Fort Wayne to Chicago. Then in Chicago, my plane, plane kept getting delayed. I'm thinking, oh, this is not going to be good. I was hating to think if I had to call you and tell you I wasn't going to get back in time. Well, Brother Tim walked in last night at uh, 4.59. That's what somebody said, yeah. I should have parked and waited a little while to come on. Here. <laughs> also, I appreciate your prayers for my voice. Uh, Kathy and I, we went through a round of Taipei flu about four or five weeks ago, and it keeps trying to, I mean, I feel better, it's just it's keep hanging on in my throat, my voice, and it's just really <clears throat> been challenged to try to preach the last few weeks uh, with that, so I, w I would appreciate your prayers for that. You know, Kathy and I, there's, there's not been, we've been married this, this July, be 42 years, and, and there's not been many times in our marriage that both of us have been down sick at the same time. We were just pitiful. You know, we, eight days, the only time we got out of the house was the doctor made us come see him. And then he put mask on us when we got there because we were running temperature and all this kind of thing. And, we, he said, and I said, you know, we had this shot. He said, well, you can still get us, you just don't get all of it. I said, I don't think I could survive all of it. <laughs> if it's not all of it, I don't want to rest, you know. <clears throat> we're, <clears throat> I'll tell you how we are after 40 something years of marriage. We're sitting up there one day upstairs, and I'm on the couch. She's on the love seat, and I said, Kathy, if you know anybody going downstairs in the next little bit, a couple things down there I might be interested in. She looks at me, and that's what she says. Well, you know, if I hear anybody going down there the next day or two, I'll let you know. <laughs> So I did without those things I was interested in. <laughs> it's good to be here. I, I love coming to Hurricane Chapel. I love being with Tim and Tammy and their family, and, and we've been friends a long time. Uh, I, I knew them back right after, I guess, when we met the first time. You'd just been married. Hadn't been married long, had you? I mean, just newlyweds almost, and, and just uh, just was drawn to them uh, immediately. And so... Uh, I just have appreciated, appreciated that friendship over the years. Why don't you take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. Probably, about one of the, probably one of the most famous little boys in Sunday school, and we don't even know his name. But we know about his lunch. It's the story of the little boy at his lunch. And I think I may have shared some of this here before, but... There's just some things with it tonight I just, I just can't get, couldn't get away from. God just kept putting it on my heart all through the day as I was traveling, sitting in the airports. It just was on my mind. And I learned a long time ago when God's doing that, I need to listen and, and be receptive and obey that because somebody is here that needs what God's been putting on my heart today. In John chapter 6, now understand the context. 
Jesus and his disciples have been in the towns and the villages, and, and Jesus has been ministering to those that are sick and casting out demons. And, uh, and so he wants to get away from the crowds with his disciples, so they go out across the plain, and there they sit on the side of a mountain there, just him and his disciples, just to fellowship. But when Jesus looks back across the plain, he sees a great multitude, the Bible says, coming toward him. Let's, let's see this in verses, beginning in verse 1 of John chapter 6. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them, that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread? that these may eat. Now, let's, let's stop right there for just a moment. Don't, you, don't miss this. If you'll do a study sometime of all the questions Jesus asked in the Bible, let me tell you what you're going to find. You'll find he never one time asked a question to learn something. He's the Son of God. He already knows. But he always asked a question that he might teach something. And boy, he's about to teach the disciples and all those folks around him that day a wonderful lesson. And so he asked Philip a question, one of his disciples. He turns to Philip, and he says, Philip, by the time they get here, by the time they go home, it's going to be a long time. They're going to be hungry. Philip, how are we going to feed that crowd? Now, we know the Bible tells us there were 5,000 men, and we know there's at least one little boy, right? Uh, Andrew brings to Jesus. So if there's one little boy. There are probably other children in that crowd. And if there are children in that crowd, you can rest assured there are some mothers in that crowd. Well, I don't know many dads going to get very far from the house with the kids without mom along to watch them. So there could have been ten to 15,000 people in this multitude coming to Jesus. And so he says, Philip, how are we going to feed that crowd? Well, Philip's response was he got overwhelmed. Let's look at it. How are we going to feed him? Verse 6, And this he, Jesus said, to prove or test him, Philip. For he himself knew what he would do. He always knew what he was going to do. Notice Philip's response. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. Philip's response was, just get overwhelmed and do nothing. Now, as we minister in our world today and in our society today, all around us tonight are multitudes of people with multitudes of needs. It seems like people today have more needs than at any time in the history of the United States. I mean, people come to church with more baggage, it seems, than, than, than at any time. It's been 23 years since I've been a pastor. Now, I'm in our churches. I'm with our pastors almost on a weekly basis. I'm in 40 to 45 different Free Baptist churches every year because I don't ever want to lose touch with where our pastors are and where our churches are. But I, I know that it's even different now than when I was pastoring 23 years ago. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just almost a, an unlimited uh, list of needs and, and things that people and issues people have when they come to church. And so it's easy to see all that and think, well, we can never meet all those needs. Or well, what could our church do? We, we could never meet those and so what, you know what we do many times? We just do nothing. That's Philip's response. But Andrew's listening. Now, he's been called the ordinary disciple. I understand that because we don't see him doing the loud, boisterous things we see the sons of thunder doing and the disciples. But let me tell you something about Andrew. There's nothing ordinary about Andrew. Because, listen, every time you see him in the Bible, you know what he's doing? He's bringing somebody to Jesus. Listen, that is my kind of disciple. And apparently he hears what Jesus says to Philip. And so he, apparently he goes down into the crowd to see what resources might be available for Jesus to use. Maybe he goes and asks, did anybody bring any food? Is it legal to get off stage? Absolutely. Thank you. You just look like I need to be down here with you. Did anybody bring any food? If you brought food with you today, would you be willing to give it to Jesus so he might meet the needs of that multitude? Well, after searching the entire crowd, he finds one little boy with one little lunch. Well, what a famous little lunch. And there he stands right before Jesus, his lunch in his hands. I want you to consider with me three things tonight about that lunch. Three very simple things. Number one, consider the amount of his lunch. Was it enough 
to meet the needs of 10 to 15,000 hungry people. Well, let's put it in perspective. The Bible says he had three, uh, five barley loaves. Now, that was not loaves of bread as we understand bread, like a loaf of bread as we understand it and sliced, you know, today. It was a loaf. It was like a small round muffin, if you will. Let me just use a term I, I know that people in, in middle Tennessee understand just like they did in, in northwest Alabama where I grew up. The boy had five barley biscuits, what he had. Now, come on, now, yeah, I know you know what a biscuit is. Come on. Five barley biscuits, and it says two small fish. Now, I don't, I don't picture two big old Tennessee catfish that have been battered and deep fried, and one of them by itself would cover an oval plate. No, it's a little boy's lunch. I picture more like two sardines. So the boy's got five barley biscuits and two sardines. Now, is that enough to meet the needs of ten to 15,000 hungry people? I suggest to you that as long as he holds it in his hands, it'll never come close to meeting the needs of that multitude. By the way, as long as he holds it in his hands, not only will it not meet the needs of the multitude, it won't even meet his own needs for long. Kathy and I have two children. Our oldest is a daughter, Nicole. Our youngest is son, Ryan. Ryan will be, in just a few days, he'll be 33 years old. When that boy was about 10, 11, 12 years old, listen, he could have swallowed five biscuits and two sardines in about two breasts and been ready for the main course. <laughs> it wasn't even going to meet the little boy's needs for long. The amount, it wasn't enough. No, in his own hands, not even close. But the Bible tells us he put it in Jesus' hands. He didn't give him some of it. He didn't give him part of it. He didn't give him most of it. He put all of it in Jesus' hands, and he took his hands off. Now I ask you, is it now enough to meet the needs of the multitude? Well, we know the rest of the story. We know that not only has it become enough, it has now in Jesus' hands become more than enough. Because we know how Jesus, as he holds it in his hands, the Bible says he blessed it. He thanked his father for it. He had, them sit, had the disciples sit the people in groups upon the ground. Then he broke those biscuits and sardines into enough pieces to put pieces in 12 disciples' hands. Now try to imagine you're one of those 12 disciples. I don't know how you study the Bible, but when I read these things, I try to imagine I'm there. What am I seeing? What am I hearing? What am I smelling? I, and that's just how I, I like to study the Bible. And uh, I've tried to imagine myself there, and Jesus has just now broken up those five barley loaves and two small fish into enough pieces to put pieces in mine and 11 other disciples' hands. Now, you know what you're holding? Crumbs. And Jesus says, now pass it out. I can almost see the expression on Peter's face. Come on, old bold, brash Peter. You know, at least he apparently, you know, if he said anything out loud, it's not recorded. But I guarantee you he's probably thinking some things whether he said out loud. Don't you know he's looking at the crumbs in his hands, looking at the ten to 15,000 hungry people, and he's thinking, pass it out. <laughs> well, just these few people in front to get these crumbs, then it'll be gone. And the rest of the crowd say they got something they didn't. And have you ever been to a church eating meeting? Well, they ran out of food before they did people. Trust me, vicious crowd. <laughs> but they knew better than to question Jesus. So they start passing it out. They keep passing it out. They can't get rid of it. They keep passing it out. The Bible says they passed it out, not until some of them got some, not until most of them got some of it, not until the majority, they passed it out, and the Bible doesn't say they all got a taste, a bite, a sample, a morsel. He passed it out, and they all ate until they were full. That's a lot of bread and fish. Then Jesus says, you know, fellas, we don't be wasteful. So go pick up what's left. <laughs> Again, don't you know, pick up what's left. But they go. The Bible says they come back with 12 baskets full left over. I just tell people that's one basket of faith per disciple that day. Because God's trying to teach them something. Jesus is trying to teach them. Listen, he's trying to teach them a lesson that God tried to teach Israel all through the Old Testament. That Jesus, time and again, tried to drive home in the hearts and minds of his disciples. A lesson he wants us to get tonight. And it's simply this. That little is much when you give it all to God. You see, God doesn't ask for much, just all. Doesn't have to be worth much, just all. And by the way, doesn't he have a right to ask for our all? He gave us the best he had when he gave us Jesus. Jesus gave us his very life. He deserves the right 
to ask for our all. The amount of it, was it, was it enough? Can I just testify a, minute, a moment? The night Kathy and I went to the altar and got right with God, and I answered the call to preach in that same altar service that night. I was 19. She was 18. We'd been married about six months. But we put everything we had and ever hoped to have, our lives and everything we had, we put it all in Jesus' hands that night. And now after 41, almost 42 years, you know what? The leftovers in our lives have been more than we ever gave God to start with. That's how God works. That's how he works. When we give him all, he takes it and uses it to bless others, and then there's still leftovers that he lets us enjoy. The amount was it enough. But the second thing I want you to consider about that little boy's lunch, not only the amount was it enough, but secondly, the adequacy of his lunch. Was it good enough? to meet the needs of the multitude. Now, let me tell you how I came to this point. Some years ago, I was doing a study. I don't even remember what I was doing a study for, but, but I was studying the types of food that people ate in Jesus' day in that part of the world. And when I did that study, I found out something I didn't know. I found out that most people in Jesus' day in that part of the world did not eat bread made from barley. As a matter of fact, most people used barley to feed their animals. Only the poorest people of society of Jesus' day ate bread made from barley. And when I saw that, a little light bulb came on in my mind and I realized right then I had just learned something about this little boy that I didn't know before. He come from one of the poorest families of society of Jesus' day. Had he not, he would have had barley bread in his lunch for him to eat. Now try to imagine that you're that little boy in that crowd and you see Andrew coming. You recognize, you think that's one of Jesus. Is that Andrew? What's he asking? What is he saying? As he gets closer, he realizes he said, Did anybody bring any food? If you brought food with you, would you be willing to give it to Jesus for him to use? Would it have been easy for him to look into his lunch of barley, bread, and fish and look around him? Now think about who else is standing around him in that crowd. I'm pretty sure there's some physicians in that crowd. They've come for, if no other reason, but to come see this great physician that they've heard has made the lame to walk and the blind to see. I'm convinced there's some lawyers in that crowd. They've come to hear this great lawgiver speak again. I'm convinced there's some Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and priests and elders. They've come for no other reason but just to hear him say something, see him do something they can use to accuse him of. Now understand, if that little boy looked around him, their robes would look a lot different than his. When they went home, they would go to a lot different kind of house than what he would go home to that day. They would wear different clothes and eat different foods. Wouldn't it have been easy for that little boy to look around him and think, you know, I'd like to give Jesus what I have. Well, what I have is not good enough. Why, Jesus couldn't use my barley bread. Why, it would be offensive to these people. This is what they feed their animals. Now, I don't know what went through his mind, but I'm just glad whatever it was, he gave his lunch to Jesus that day because we have this story that has encouraged millions of people through the years. It's my opinion that one of the greatest devices Satan uses today is to tell us and convince us that what we have is not good enough for Jesus to use. He keeps people from coming to Christ with that lie. Why, you're, what, you know, look how bad you've been. Look how bad you are. Look at all the things you've done. Why, you're not good enough for Jesus to save. Can I just tell you, you won't ever get good enough for Jesus to save. It's not about how good you are. It's not about how bad you are. It's about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, we have to understand. Satan keeps so many Christians from doing the things for God that they need to be doing by convincing us what you have is not good enough. Well, you're just offensive to others. You're just an embarrassment to Jesus. Why don't you just quit? Now, now am I talking to people that this never, these things never come into your heart and mind? And maybe you folks are on a higher spiritual plane than I am. But I'm, that's how he works in me sometimes. Matter of fact, almost every day. 
He doesn't miss one chance. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care what position you find yourself in. Satan will keep trying to deceive us and, and use these things to keep us from doing what we ought to do until the day we die or Jesus comes and gets us, takes us out of here. I want to share with you why this story is so important to me. Of course, all of God's words are important to me, but some passages, some stories just seem to resonate a little more in my life. And I think that's probably true in your life with some passages of Scripture as well. As far back as I have memories, you know what I'm saying? As far back into my child as I can remember anything at all, I've, all, I've, had, I've had some nervous twitches. Now, when I grew up, I grew up in rural northwest Alabama, and a child in the 60s, a teenager in the 70s. Now, they didn't understand much about those things back then. Nowadays, they're called ticks, and, and there are people having to do different things, causes those ticks, and there's all kind, they have all kind of fancy names, uh, you know, to try to, you know, help people to understand all that. And, but they didn't know much about that when I was a boy growing up in uh, Pea Ridge, Alabama. And, and you do understand, uh, other children can be very cruel about those kind of things. And it, my, as a child, a teenager came out more in my face, my mouth, and my neck, which made it a whole lot more noticeable. And so, the, you know, they, they would mock and laugh and make fun of that twitch. And so I, I grew up at, with a very severe inferiority complex. I could, not only could I not think about standing in front of a group of people and say anything, I could barely look one person eye to eye and have a conversation with them, Tim, because I'm thinking they're not listening to what I'm saying. Just watching those twitches. I've not shared this. I don't know that I've shared this in, in any other church. In my senior year of high school, 1976, we, seniors would do a senior night before graduation. And they'd sing songs and do skits and introduce everybody in the class. And, and then they'd do what they called senior gifts. I don't know if your, your schools ever did this. And most of these gifts uh, weren't nice. And depending on who they put in charge of doing it, sometimes they weren't nearly as nice as they had been and were a whole lot worse than they'd ever been. And so most of them were given to try to embarrass and humiliate people. Now, we had it in our gymnasium in Winfield, and uh, it seated about 2,500 people. That thing would be full. It was full on our senior class night. Population of the town we lived in, Winfield, was like 3,500, so over half the population of the town was in, in the gym. And all my peers, all my friends, my family, and most of the population of my hometown. Came time to get my gift. You know what my gift was? They presented me with a bottle of muscle relaxer. So it's been very difficult for me to get past some of those insecurities and inferiority complexes and things because of that. And uh, they didn't know what to call it then. My dad took me to a doctor when I was 14, and the doctor examined me. He sat there, he said to my dad, he said, Mr. Crowley, it's just a nervous habit. If he really wanted to, he could stop. He said, what I wish they could have understood is I'd have given everything I had and hoped to have to stop it. It came out when and where it wanted to. I've never had any control over it. When I was 11 years old, I knew God wanted me to be a preacher. I, I was in church since I was a baby. I, I, I don't know what it's like not to be in church. I know what it's like to be away from God. I know what it's like to be running from God as hard as you can run. But I couldn't get out of church. My father, Harold Crow, listen, Free Will Baptist Deacon, he did give me and my brother and my sister, he gave us a choice about going to church. We could go or die. <laughs> I'm here so you know what choice I made. But 11 years old, so just, some circle, just some things, I knew God wanted me to preach it. And I started running when I was 11 years old. I started running from God as hard as I could run. I had to go to church. I had to be in Bible sword drill, Bible tic-tac-toe, and Bible bowl. By the time I was 16, I could quote more scripture than most pastors I know today. By the time I was 16, I was also practically a teenage alcoholic, singing louder than anybody in the youth choir. I was running. I thought I was running because I didn't want to be a preacher. But as I got into my adult life, I began to understand that wasn't it at all. You see, the thing was, I think I really wanted to be a preacher. 
See, I've never been, even when I wasn't living right and running, I've never been the kind of guy like to knock people down. I, I'd be the guy picking them up and brushing them off and helping them go on their way. And I saw preachers being that, as that being that kind of men, and, and, and I think I really did want to be a preacher. But I just couldn't believe that God could use somebody like me. I just couldn't believe that God would want somebody like me. So I ran as hard as I could run. Until I was 19 years old, married six months, we had a revival in our church. And on Thursday night of that revival, January the 5th, 1978, when I went to the altar that night, I finally came to my right mind. I quit running from God and I ran to him that night. It already stopped. The invitation was already closed. I couldn't take it. I opened it back up. I ran as hard as I could run down that center aisle. When I got to pew where my mom and dad sat, my mom saw it. Well, she laughed big. Come on, come on. She wore a hoop, come running down there. Her dad right behind. Kathy had been up on stage. She had just given a testimony. She comes running around down the steps to me. We had rails across. I hit my knees, slide up here in front of the table and our altars there. And my pastor got so excited. Now, he was a big man. He got so excited, he jumped to rail. Missed me about this much. I tell people my Christian life almost started and ended in the same instant. I want you to understand something. I put everything in his hands that night. Everything. I didn't know what to call that twitch. I didn't know that it was, I didn't know then it was tigs. And I just, I said, Lord, I don't want you. And I answered called call to preach in that same altar that same night. Because that's what I've been running from God from all the time. I said, God, I don't know what you think you can do with me. But I'm going to put it in your hands. And you do with it as you see fit. And I walked away that night. Now, and even though I did that, now listen to me. For 38 years of ministry, I pastored 13 years. I was evangelist for a couple of years. And I've been working for North American Ministries now for 23 years, going on 24 years. For 38 years, I've been in ministry now, 41 years. But for 38 years, there was not a day that passed in my life that I didn't pray and ask God to take that Tourette's away. You see, when I was 30 years old, I was finally diagnosed by a doctor that I have a mild case of Tourette's syndrome. And I prayed every day. Before I knew what it was called, and when I knew then what it was, I prayed. And I, I begged him every day to take it away. And he never took it away. But let me tell you how good God is. Even though he didn't take it away, you know what he did? People ask me sometimes, why do you preach like you preach? You don't act like a lot of Baptist preachers we know. You're pretty loud, pretty emotional, rather mobile. Now, trust me, not everybody likes loud, emotional, and mobile preaching. And they say, why do you preach like you do? That's what I usually tell them. I said, well, it's like this. I said, you know, when it really gets good, I mean, it just, you know how it is, Tim, it just starts to get good, and people amen and agging it on, you know. And I mean, in the spirit, just like he's pouring it in, it's just, it's just easy. I mean, it just flows. And, you, and, and listen, I, I get excited. Now, listen, I'll never apologize about getting excited about preaching God's word. And I get excited, and I mean, I get down front, and, and sometimes I get in the aisle. Sometimes I get all the way to the back because I want you folks in the back to get your money's worth this way. And when it's really getting good and God just working, moving, spirit flowing, I mean, I mean, here we are. You don't know if it's twitch or preach. <laughs> That's how good God is. That's how good he is. As I've gotten older, that, those twitches first moved down into my left arm and left leg. And a few years ago, shifted to my right arm and right leg. And several times for all those years, I it was that left arm. I, I learned where to sit my drink so I wouldn't knock it over and embarrass myself. And when it first started coming out right arm, I, I, I knocked my drink over in restaurants a few times, embarrassed myself, you know. I shared that one night in service. After church, a young couple asked me to go out and eat with them. I go, the whole meal, I could never find my drink. He kept moving it. <laughs> He's helping me. He's helping me. 38 years I begged him to take it away. He never took it away, but can I tell you what he did? That's how good God is. As I've traveled across this continent, I've met so many people with Tourette's, young people, children, teenagers, young adults, and a few older ones. 
And most of them have a much more severe case of it than I have. I mean, most of them would, would jerk violently and constantly and hardly had any peace or rest at any time. If they, if they took medication, it, would, it, made, it, it made them like a zombie. They were out of it. You don't know how many of those God's let me minister to. When they wouldn't listen to anybody else, they'd listen to me. Time and again, I would take one. one it, it, I remember a young man, his head jerked constantly all the time. I, I just put my hands on the sides of his face, and I held his face still. And I said, now you look at me. You look at me. You look me in the eyes. You have value, and you have worth. Amen. You look me in the eyes. And then I say, don't you let this define who you are. You put it in God's hands and let God define who you are. Amen. And he's allowed me to minister to so many people with Tourette's. There are all kinds of symptoms. Some of them make sounds. Some of them profanity comes out. They, they can't help it. Now, I'm you, I thank God many times I don't have that symptom. <laughs> that, that'd be bad right in the middle of a sermon, wouldn't it? It's a big, long cussing stream. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, folks. Trent's talking there. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> and then when I became director of our department a little over five years ago, I would pray and I try to make bargains with God. I try to I try to talk God into things. Now I know you don't do this. You know, try to you know deal with him and convince him. And I say, now, Lord. I'm director of a national department. Don't you think I'd be a little more effective if you'd take that away? I have to meet with college presidents and bank presidents and lawyers. And, and Lord, don't you think, don't, if you take away, I think, Lord, I could be so, so much more effective. He doesn't listen to any of it. Well, he does, but he don't, do, he don't change it. Now, you hear me? 38 years Every day I prayed and begged him to take it away. But about two and a half years ago, God let something come into my life that has changed the way I pray. I got on a Delta flight. I fly Delta most of the time where I go. And uh, matter of fact, I tell people I, I fly Delta so much, I'm close to becoming the chaplain of Delta Airlines. And uh, you know you're traveling too much. When one of the Delta employees at the Nashville airport retires and you get invited to the thing. <laughs> so I fly them so much. I have, I have unlimited first class upgrades. It doesn't cost an, an extra penny. It's just been tra for traveling so much. And so I bumped up to first class. There were five rows of seats in first class. And I was in the second row. I was in the window seat. The aisle seat was empty. So there's still people coming on. And I hear this loud man's voice. And I can't see him yet. He's, he's not come on. He's, he's in the jetway. I mean, he's not even on the plane yet. And I hear, I can hear him. I mean, he's loud and he's obnoxious and he's rude and he's crude and just say, I mean, saying terrible things. And, and when I finally he comes on the plane, starts down the aisle. See, he, he's just tall guy. He's got this cowboy hat, a big old belt buckle, and and and, and cowboy boots. And, and and he's just and he's and I look. He's not talking to anybody. He, he doesn't have a phone. He, he's not even on the phone. He, he doesn't have a thing. He's he just talking. Loud. He keeps talking about where he comes from, everything's better. Where he comes from, everything's bigger. Now, let me just ask you folks, if you're from Texas, just let me, please forgive me right now. I'm sitting there thinking, I bet he's from Texas. <laughs> sure enough, he said something later he was. But anyway, as he's coming down that highway, now understand something. I, I'm physically exhausted. Most of the time, I don't leave enough time between my trips for my body to recover. And, and, and I was physically exhausted. And, and listen, when I get very tired or I'm sick, sometimes I don't always respond to things in as gracious a way as I would like to. I'm just putting it as nice as I can. And so, and you got to understand, I tell people one of the greatest struggles I have, I am possessed by a redneck. Now, now, now what I mean is this. What, what I mean is this. Paul said that even after he got saved, every day there was a battle went on inside of him. Flesh wars against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. If Paul had that struggle, we'll have that same struggle. So I tell you, well, that's what I call my flesh. That's my resident redneck. Now, one guy says his name Legion. I said, no, I think his name's Leroy. But anyway, <laughs> most days I keep him beaten down right well. 
But some days when I'm really tired or I'm sick or I've already been around an unusual number of aggravating people before I got to you. And can I just tell you, free will back, we've been blessed with more than our share of aggravating people. <laughs> And so I'm tired, and it's, I know if he said, and he starts, and he does that mess, but I, and, I, and so I started praying. I said, Lord, please don't let him sit down beside me. <laughs> God does that stuff to me. <laughs> Puts people beside me he wants me to talk to, and, and they're not always nice. Sometimes they are, but not always. And I'm, Lord, please, <laughs> Lord, you know how tired I am. Lord, he, he starts that mess. I'd hate to have to whip him all over this airplane. <laughs> So I'm praying, and, and he, he don't even look at me. He just walks right on by me. I'm saying, oh, thank you, Jesus. It's a good day. Thank you, Jesus. Didn't make me sit by him. And so he sits down. I look back. He, he sits in the fifth row, the last row of, of first class. And so he's, and people still come. Now, he's still, he's just talking. I mean, he's just loud, just saying stupid and, and crude. And, 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 and I, just, I mean, I, I didn't even know why. I mean, there was no purpose to it. And, and so he just keeps us going. We, we finally, we, uh, they get everybody on. We take off. We're up in the air flying. We've been flying a while. He's, he hasn't stopped. I look back and the guy sitting beside him, bless his heart, he was turned completely away from him. <laughs> About halfway through the flight, one of the flight attendants comes over to me. She says, sir, can I ask you a question? I said, well, sure. She said, that guy back there doing all that loud, and rude talking, she says, do you know who he is? I said, ma'am, I thought I'd been being good. I mean, what, what was the reason? Why did you ask me? I said, ma'am, I don't know him. She said, well, I just thought, you know, he wears cowboy boots and you wear cowboy boots. I said, so you think everybody in the world that wears cowboy boots knows each other? I said, I don't know him. I never seen him until he walked in. I said, yes, he is rude. Yes, he is crude. But I don't know him. <laughs> we're, coming down, we're coming down to land now. He, he, he hasn't stopped the whole flight. I mean, it's just, and I, I, I was amazed that the flight attendants didn't go and, and, and ask him. I guess they were afraid to. I mean, he just got, got so gruff and crude. And, and so we're about to land. I'm thinking, now, Lord, you've been good to me. You didn't make me sit by him on this flight. So, Lord, help me when we get to the gate. You know, you fly much, you can split second that seatbelt sign going off. I said, Lord, help me get up quick, get my bag, and get out of here fast. Get out, because I don't have to have any opportunities. This, this far, I had to say one thing to him. I, I said, Lord, I don't have any opportunity to have, to have say anything. I don't want to talk to him. So, I mean, when the light goes off, man, I'm up. I got my bag. I am standing at the door waiting for them to open that, that plane door so I, I can get out of there. They open it, man. I'm up the jet wall. I'm in the concourse, big airport, busy people everywhere. I'm in the concourse, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to walk to my connecting flight. And as well, I'm thinking, Lord, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, you. You've been so good to me. Thank you. Lord, you didn't make me sit by that guy. And all of a sudden, but from somewhere behind me, I hear this loud boy say, Hey, you! Now, I know my name's not Hey You, but who's not going to turn around and look? I turn around, it was him, and he's pointing at me. He said, yeah, you, wait a minute. I said, Lord, you didn't make, I, you let me have the whole flight. I didn't have to talk, and now you're going to be you're running me down in the airport. When he gets to me, catches his breath, he looks at me, he says, can I ask you a question? I figured he's going to ask me a question whether I said yes or no. So I said, well, sure. This way he said, he said, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and then he said, that affects your, and he's, and he's doing what, I, what I'm about to do is what he's doing. He said, it affects your motor skills, so. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> Just somebody you don't even know. <laughs> now, <laughs> I can be real sarcastic if I want to be. And sometimes it happens when I don't want to be. One guy said he had the gift of sarcasm. I said, oh, no, that's not a gift. And the redneck is starting to try to climb out. And what I want to say, I mean, I mean, come, what's wrong with you? Fix your motor skills so. 
What I want to say is, oh, you mean my ability to work on cars? <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. But I beat the redneck down and I didn't say it. What I said was, I said, well, sir, if you have to know, I have a mild case of Tourette's. He said, I knew it. I'm thinking, then why did you run me down and ask me? <laughs> and then he looks at me and it's what he says. He said, did God put you on that plane for me? He kind of caught me off guard. And I said, well, sir, I, I believe he does those kind of things. Why do you think that? And his whole demeanor begins to change. His voice lowers and softens. He said, you're a preacher, aren't you? Now, I don't travel in a suit and tie. It's hard enough to travel casual. And, you know, I'm sure I had on jeans, my shirt tail out, and, and I don't have this sticker I put on my forehead. Yes, I'm a preacher. You know, <laughs> behave yourself around me. You know. He said, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, yeah. He said, uh, you don't pastor a church right now, do you? I said, no. He says, you travel all over the place and preach a lot of all over, don't you? This is getting kind of creepy now because I don't know this guy. And I said, yeah. And he says, God uses you, doesn't he? And I said, well, sir, all, all I can tell you is that's my heart. I, I want him to use me. He said, oh, he does. And this is what he said. He said, I used to be in church serving the Lord faithfully. I had a younger brother with a very severe case of Tourette syndrome. So bad that not only would he not get out of the house, he rarely even came out of his room. When he was 16 years old, he could take it no more, and he took his own life in his bedroom. And I was the one who found him. He said, I've been mad at God ever since. I got out of church, quit going. I've been away from him for years now. But God lately has been dealing with me. And when I came on that plane and I came past you, God just impressed me. That man's a preacher. When you get off this plane, you be sure you catch him and you need to talk to him. And then a tear started running down his face. And this is what he says. He said, sir, do you have time? We can step over here and you can pray with me and help me get right with God. I said, yes, sir, I got time. Listen, if I didn't have time, I'd have made time. So we step out, and I mean, there's still, I mean, there's just people everywhere, crazy. So we step over to some seats, and I, I'm, I'm about to sit down, and well, he just drops on his knees, and, and just his face, and I hand, his face just down in the seat of that chair. So, so I turn, I got I kneeled, and, and I said, no, I'm going to pray. I'll pray out loud first, and then when I finish, and then you pray. So I prayed for him out loud for a little while, and, and then he started praying. I learned right then, he doesn't do anything soft. He starts praying to the top of his lungs. I mean, he's screaming. Oh, oh, listen, begging. Oh, oh, God, what a sorry, rotten, terrible wretch I've been. Oh, God, please forgive me. God, I, I, I couldn't blame you. If you, don't, if you don't want to forgive me, I couldn't blame you one bit, God, because I've been so sorry, and I've, I've failed you. And I mean, he just, and, and just loud. And I mean, it's, I know everybody in, in this concourse is, it has to hear it. And I feel people coming up behind us. You know, you can tell. And so I just kind of opened one eye and, and, and you, you know, watch and pray, the Bible says. And there's people that, st there are people gathered up behind us. And, and, and then I start hearing every now and then, I say, well, amen. Well, 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 praise the Lord. Then one woman says, well, hallelujah. I'm thinking, oh, my Lord, we're going to have a revival right here in the airport. <laughs> and I'm sure that's illegal. I'm going to get arrested for putting, <laughs> instigating a revival in the airport. Man. We find, he finally got through praying. We stood up. There was 40 or 50 people had gathered up around us. They start hugging our necks and kissing us on the cheek like we're family. They hadn't seen in years. I mean, I, I have never experienced anything like it. Well, we, they finally get all gone. It's just me and him again. And he says to me, he says, he says, preacher, he said, I'm going to get home over and tell my wife what I've done. And I promise you, we're going to get in, in church and get back faithful serving the Lord. I said, that's, that's what you need to do. He gave me his card. I gave him mine. By the way, that's been about two and a half, a little over two and a half years ago, almost three. He contacted me about eight months ago, 
and told me again that the church that he and his wife had gotten involved in, he does live in Texas. And he told me, he says, and we've just started our church. Through our church, we have just started, my wife and I are in charge of it, a ministry to people with Tourette's. See, when God does things, he does it right. Now, as I, as I was walking away from him in that airport, now stay with me, listen to me very carefully what I'm about to tell you. As I was walking away from him for 38 years of ministry, I prayed every day and begged God to take the threats away so I could be more effective. As I walked away from him that day, I, I'm just, I can't get over it. I'm thinking, Satan, you used that to try to discourage and defeat me and embarrass me. But God took it and got glory from it. And it's going to touch a lot of other people's lives here on out. And for the first time, and you hear me walking through that airport, for the first time in my life, for the first time in 38 years, I prayed and I said, God, thank you for Tourette's. It helps me to keep a right perspective of life and a right perspective of ministry that no matter what you may do through our ministry, through North American ministry, no matter what you may do through the ministry where I may be, I know that it's not me, it's you. And I said, God, thank you for Tourette's. It allows me to minister to people I would have never gotten to minister to otherwise. And so every day, since that almost three years ago, Every day, I still pray about Tourette's. But every day now, I say, Lord, thank you for Tourette's. Use it in my life to help me to minister to somebody today. I had a stroke. This may be two years ago. I had a stroke. I was in the hospital in Nashville a couple days and nights. And, and uh, one of the doctors came in. It was named Dr. Turkowitz. Interesting guy. When he found out I was a preacher, every time he'd leave my room, he'd go, blessings. <laughs> you know what that, I mean, I thought there was some kind of hybrid Catholic thing. Right? <laughs> blessings. But he came in that night. I, I was there, and they were running tests. He, and he says to me, he says, these young doctors think you've had a stroke. He said, but that's not what it is. He said, you've got Miller-Fisher syndrome. And, I didn't know Mr. Miller Fisher or nothing about his syndrome. But I, never even heard, I never even heard of it. And, of course, what, when he told me what it was, it, he said, well, if it, that's what it is, I'm sure it is. I'm going to let them run their tests, but it's gonna, that's what it's going to be. He says it's going to get a whole lot worse before it gets better, and it's already pretty bad. And he said, and if that's what it is, and I, I know it is, he says, uh, we'll probably have to tap your spine tomorrow and do blood infusions for six days. He said, that's what it is, and I'm convinced it is. We'll probably have to put you on a respirator in, in just a couple of days because your lung capacity, your lungs are going to just almost shut down. And we'll have to put you on a respirator to finally cure you and, and save your life. And uh, as he walked out, that was a pretty big load when you already don't feel good, you're already sick. And uh, so the next morning, one of the young doctors comes in, puts my scan my brain scan up on the thing and points, and he, show, he said, here, right here, uh, Mr. Crow, and they, what happened, I guess, a blood vessel in the back of my brain here collapsed. It's what caused it. He's, he's dead. It was definitely a stroke. And so he left, and, and just a little bit, Dr. Turkowitz came in. He, he wasn't near as happy. I mean, he's just all smiling, happy, joking. When he's, uh, he comes in, he kind of kind of down. He says, well, they've run the test, and you've just had a stroke. I mean, you know, people have strokes every day. Not everybody, not, not all times. Somebody come here with Miller Fisher syndrome. <laughs> and see, when he walked out, I said, Kathy, did he seem kind of disappointed? She said, Yeah, he did. She, she said, Yeah, he's, he's going to write that up in a medical journal, how he cured you all that, and you just messed all that up. <laughs> but the last day, I was waiting to check out. Young doctor came in, and they always asked me questions and say things about, you know, things, did, did, were you this way before the stroke? Did you do this? Did, they asked Kathy several times, was he like this before, <laughs> before the stroke? <laughs> she said, yeah, I've known him since I, he was nine and I was eight. He's been that way ever since I've known him. And, um, but the doctor, this young doctor, he says, I hate to ask you, 
it's nothing personal. He, I know you have, he said, I know you have several ticks. He said, did you have these before you started? I said, yes, sir, I have a mild case Tourette's, uh, far back as I can remember. So before I get gone, Dr. Turkowitz finds out I have Tourette's. He comes back in my room. I mean, he's all happy again. <laughs> and he says, he, he says, I understand you have Tourette's. <laughs> yes, sir. He said, I'm a Tourette's doctor. I said, you are? He said, yeah. You know, when you get all over all this, and he said, make an appointment. I will, I, I'll treat you. I want to treat you. I said, no, it's okay. He said, no, I, I don't, I, I'm really. I said, it's okay. He said, he said, I won't even charge you. I said, Doc, that's okay. I, 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 don't, I don't want to come. He said, you don't want me to help you? We don't have, you don't want me to help? I said, you got to understand something. I said, if I go to you and you cure me, it'll mess up a couple of pretty good sermons I preach. He walked out there mad at me again. <laughs> you see, I said, Doc, you got to understand, this is all I've ever known. It's a part of who I am. And after 59, 60 years with it, you know, it's just become a part of me and who I am. And you see, I believe God still wants to use it to help me to reach others. To help me to minister to others. And you know what? Those things in your life that you think are the mistakes and the weaknesses may be the very thing God wants to take and use in your life for His glory. For His glory. Would you bow with me for prayer? With your heads bowed, there are three points to that lunch. The amount, was it enough? The adequacy, was it good enough? And the final one is this. Until the little boy made it available for Jesus to use, the amount and the adequacy didn't matter at all. Until he let Jesus have it to be able to use it, he made it available. It's only when you make your life available for Jesus that he's going to use you. And what I want to know tonight is this. You may be here tonight, and there's never been a time You've invited Jesus Christ to come into your heart and be Lord of your life, forgive you of your sin to save you. If you've never done that, what are you waiting on? You waiting for this world to get better? Listen, it's not getting better. It's getting worse at a rapid pace. Jesus is the only one that can get you from this life to heaven. There are not many ways. There's one way, and it's Jesus. So if you've never given him your life, put your body, soul, and spirit, everything you are, in his hands, and let him come in and take control and be in charge of your life and have a relationship with him. Oh, listen, why won't you do that tonight? While you've got opportunity to do it, while you've still got breath to breathe and a chance and his Holy Spirit speaks to your heart. And then, Christian friend, has there ever been a time since you got saved that you knelt in an altar or somewhere and you said, Lord, I'm putting everything in your hands. Nothing's left out. I'm going to take my hands off of it, Lord, and I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you to take care of it. If you've never have done that, this would be a good night to do that. And then there's some of you Christians here that may be like I am. I put it all in his hands years ago, but then sometimes I faced some problems and circumstances of life. I got tired of waiting on God and got impatient, and I put my hands back on some things. That I once had given to him and I tried to handle it myself and I make a mess out of it every time I do that and I wind up having to go right back to him and put it right back in his hands and take my hands off but I'm so glad that he is the master of cleaning up the messes we make when we try to handle those things ourselves I believe God's speaking to some of you right now. I don't know who this message was for. I didn't intend it, didn't plan to preach it, but I could not get away from it today. 
And I don't enjoy sharing with you and telling you about my weaknesses and my shortcomings. But if it'll help you to understand we all are in this thing together. If it'll help you to understand we all face these kind of things on a daily basis. Maybe as you sit right where you are, the Spirit of God speaks to your heart right now. Maybe you need to get up from where you are right now and come in this altar, place everything in His hands. Take your hands off and walk away from it tonight. Maybe you need to get up right now and come and in this altar put some things back in His hands that once were there, but you put your hands back on for whatever reason. If you hadn't already made a mess of it, trust me, you will. So just go ahead and put it back in His hands. And dear friend, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please tonight, please consider, oh, please consider giving Him your life, letting Him have control of your life. Lord Jesus, I love you. Lord, I'm sorry. And it took me 38 years to come to the place. I could say thank you for Tourette's. But Lord, thank you so much for letting those things come in my life to help me to understand my Christian walk ministry. And I believe there's some folks tonight, Lord, that you're letting come through some things right now that they don't understand. And there's some sitting here tonight that have some weaknesses and failures and mistakes that you've been, they've been begging you for years to take away. Or maybe tonight they just need to come and say, thank you, Lord. You take them and use them through me to help others. You take them and use them, Lord, to give glory to yourself. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, would you stand quietly to your feet as we stand together in prayer? As the music just plays softly, we don't even have to sing. I don't want you focused on singing. I want you focused on the Holy Spirit of God and what He wants you to do. I'm talking to every man, woman, boy, or girl in this place. I don't know what those weaknesses are. I don't know what those mistakes are. I don't know what those problems are. I don't know what you've asked God for so many times to take away. But I don't need to know. I know this. If you'll come put those things in His hands tonight and take your hands off and say, Lord, it's yours. I promise you, you can leave here different tonight than you came in. You can leave here with a much lighter load than you came in. So as we wait just a moment, if you need to come, you come on right now. Don't wait for somebody else. God spoke to you. God spoke to you. Now, I'm not going to tarry long. You've been so kind and so patient already. I'm not going to take advantage of you. But I want you to have opportunity for God to speak to your heart. And if you need to come, to come tonight. Jesus, we are thankful and we are humbled tonight for the Word of God. And we're reminded, Lord, that it's, it's not about our amount. It's whether or not we're willing to give it all. Our strengths and our weaknesses. Our victories and our defeats. And I pray, Heavenly Father, you'd help us to take the Word of God tonight and Lord, we would use it to, Lord, you would use it to mold us and make us who you would have us to be. And that, Lord, you would take that and help us to be able to minister to others. Thank you for Brother David and his ministry. And bless him and Sister Kathy and their ministry there at North American Ministries. Lord, we just pray your health and strength upon them. And souls for their labor 
Lord, we pray that over the next couple of nights that you will continue to send the Word of God to us. Lord, that our hearts will be open to receive it. Before we lift our heads tonight, and we're going to be dismissed in just a few moments, I, I hope that you're taking what has been shared tonight to heart and realize that it may be the very weakest thing in your life that God will use for His greatest glory. And you can count on this. When the Lord brings you through something, He'll use you then to be a witness and a help to someone else when they come to that place in their life. But are you going to make yourself available to be used of God? I hope that you will. Tonight, if you have a need in your heart or your life, and before we leave, you say, Brother Tim, I just want the church to remember me in prayer. Would you just slip up your hand tonight? Is there one? God bless you. God bless these hands. Are there others? God bless you. God sees your hand. We want to pray for those needs tonight. God bless you. God sees that hand. Brother Jeff Edgman, would you pray and dismiss us tonight?